Okay, so this morning we are going to finish up with our study of the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're beginning in chapter 11, verse 7. Um, some of this really kind of related a little more to what we were talking about last week than it does uh, the final uh, summary of the book that uh, the preacher is going to give to us in the 12th chapter. And yet at the same time, it moves in that direction. And I think so it's appropriate for us to start there. Um, and he begins in verse seven by saying that light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So again, this idea of light um, is uh, in, an indication that life, light is kind of a picture of that. It's sweet in the sense that it symbolizes all the sweet things of life. I think you can realize that when you think about what is it like to be in the darkness all the time? It's not a lot of fun. It's not a great joy. Light is what we long for, what we long to see. And you remember that the preacher has constantly given us this point of view that even though life is vain, life can, uh, life uh, apart from God is vain, it's useless, it's meaningless. And yet at the same time, when we, when we take God into the equation, when we put God back into the picture, we're able to enjoy life, we're able to rejoice in it. Uh, we're able to uh, be able to enjoy the, the pleasures of, of life. And that's, again, what he's telling us here is we should be rejoicing in those things uh, about life that are sweet. And then he says, really, to, I think, virtually all of us, um, so if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, but let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. So, here he's, uh, he's moving back and forth. You're going to see this. He's going to be talking about older people. Um, and that's the verse right before us. It's a person who lives many years. And we've all lived many years. Some of us have lived more many years than others. But, uh, but we have all are in that category. And uh, then he's going to move back to the youth uh, in another verse. And then he's going to come back to older people. Um, because he's giving advice to both, uh, both uh, groups of people. Um, and all uh, focusing on essentially the same thing, our walk with the Lord. Um, and he says, as he mentioned in the first verse that we looked at, that it's a joy to live many years. We should rejoice in every day that God gives us, no matter how many days that is. And yet, at the same time, we need to recognize that there are going to be days of darkness. There are going to be days when we experience loss, when we experience disappointment, when we uh, suffer grief, maybe even injustice. You remember he spent a whole lot of time talking about the injustice of life and then ultimately death um, and the dying process, which he's going to talk about in a little bit more depth uh, later. All of these things are what he considers to be days of darkness. They're mixed together. And Ecclesiastes has always tried to give us a realistic view of life, the beauty of life, the happiness of life, um, but also the, the, the times when there's going to be sorrow. And I think the message, even though he doesn't say it so much in this verse as he will in others, is instead of complaining about the difficulties of life, we need to be able to rejoice in each day that God has given us. You remember the psalmist says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That attitude is the one he wants us to have, and he wants us to hold on to that as long as we live. And he's going to be honest with us as we get older, it's harder to do that because of the way life is and because of the difficulties that old age brings, it's much more difficult to rejoice and it's so much easier to complain. And so he wants us to recognize that and to focus on the beauty of what God has given us. So then in verse nine, he goes back to the youth, rejoice, O young man, in your youth and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Um, when we're young, we should rejoice in our youth. Uh, we have all those things that we don't have today. We have, generally speaking, stronger bodies. Uh, we're more agile. We're more uh, able to do things. Uh, we have, uh, I put freedom to risk. I mean, most of us are kind of risk averse at this age, but back then we, uh, we took a lot of chances as, as a young people because we felt really, you know, almost uh, indestructible. We were more idealistic. We were more optimistic. 
we most of us probably felt we could change the world. Now we're not so sure that we can. Um, and all of these things come with youth. And he he indicates that when we're young, we should appreciate youth. We should we should uh, be cheered by it. But he wants us to be, I guess we could say, responsibly rejoicing. Um, our culture, we live in a culture, and I think it's pretty clear, our culture worships youth. Um, that's where it's at. As we get older, uh, many cultures uh, appreciate older people and, and uh, revere them for their wisdom and, and such. Our culture really um, puts them aside. It's the youth um, that everybody's interested in. And so you see people trying to remain young their whole lives, trying to, to do whatever it takes to, to have that young looking uh, face or that young looking body. Um, and so the preacher would be very, very clear about that. We are not to idolize youth. We are not to dread its loss. It is, uh, to, to use his phrase that he used back in chapter three, it's beautiful in its time, but it also has a time. There's a time to be young and there's a time to not be young. And we need to recognize the changing of the time and to adjust. And so his message is be, uh, be cheered by your youth, uh, but understand and we're going to see in a minute that it's not going to last very long. Uh, the next verse, verse, uh, or the next part of that verse, uh, walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. Uh, in other words, do what, uh, do what your heart calls you to do and, and the things that you see that you, you would enjoy doing. But he says, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Enjoy life's pleasures. Um, therefore, but not in sinful ways. Um, it's good to celebrate um, the gift of youth, but at the same time, we need to follow God's commandments, and we need to flee from sin. We need to be careful that we don't uh, use our youth uh, to, be, um, to be doing things that are displeasing to God, because um, that word judgment um, is literally the judgment. He's saying that there's going to come a day when everyone is going to be judged by God, a God who knows all the secrets of men, and he's going to judge those secrets in Christ Jesus. And we'll see this later on as well. He repeats himself because he wants us to understand that everything that we do makes a difference. Um, and therefore, even as young people, as well as older people, we need to be wise in the way that we live our lives, and we need to live our lives um, responsibly before God. Verse 10 then takes us back to old age. <laughs> it's kind of frustrating a little bit because we go from youth to old age, back to youth, and it's hard to keep them straight. But um, remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Here he's actually telling us as older people to, um, to, to eliminate where we can the bad things of life that trouble our bodies and our souls. Uh, a vexation would probably be any problem that we would have that would cause us worry or concern. It might make us angry. It might grieve us or irritate us. Um, now, what he doesn't do is he doesn't tell us how to get rid of them. He just tells us to get rid of them. Uh, and so I use the Apostle Paul um, and his message in Philippians um, to give an answer to that, because I think that's really what Paul is doing um, in, in Philippians, is he's, I guess, I, I don't think he had necessarily the uh, preacher in mind, but, um, but what he's doing is he's really explaining to us how it is that we are to put away vexations, put away anxiety. So in chapter four, find here. I'm going to back up. Did I say four, six, seven, six seven. and seven? I'm going to back up all the way to four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul says, take the things to the Lord, give them to the Lord, um, all of your vexations, all of your anxieties, 
and God will provide that peace which passes all understanding to you in Christ Jesus. Uh, whereas the preacher doesn't give us all that advice, that's really where he's focused. And then he says, and put away pain. Uh, so if our suffering is physical, the preacher says it is right and good for us to seek a way to ease that pain. Um, physical pain is an evil. Um, you can see that if you have a, if you have a Bible with, uh, with uh, textual footnotes, um, those Bibles will have a note that says, instead of the word, um, instead of the word, uh, where my Bible says uh, pain, it says put away evil from your body. Now, it's not talking about sin. It's talking about pain being evil. Um, those words are, uh, are, are very similar. And so the idea is that there, it's right that we would avoid those things. If, if there's a way that we can do it uh, that honors the Lord, we are to free our bodies from pain as much as possible. God would want us to do that. Um, it's not always easy to do, but uh, there certainly is wisdom in trying to do that where um, the, the action would be honorable to God. And then he says, it's because youth and the dawn of life are vanity. And again, you remember here that we have used this word vanity in a number of different ways. It essentially means the same thing, but depending upon what he's talking about, the emphasis is different. So sometimes vanity means meaningless or pointless or useless. But here, that isn't what he, he doesn't mean that youth is useless. He means that it's fleeting. He means that it's um, elusive. It doesn't last very long. It's like the picture of our breath on a, on a cold winter day where we see that mist, that vapor, and then it's gone. And what he's saying is youth doesn't last long. And then pretty soon our bodies begin to deteriorate and we begin to struggle with these things. And we need to recognize that to be so and then take advantage of the things that we have. But the key is to deal with our anxieties, to deal with our vexations in a, in a way that pleases God and even our um, physical ailments if we can, recognizing, of course, that that isn't always possible. So this theme is really con continued as we begin chapter 12, because the preacher is still focused on um, youth and age. Um, he starts with youth in verse 1 of chapter 12. He's going to move quickly to this, this beautiful uh, picture, beautiful poem of people aging. It's one of the most beautiful uh, poems, I think, in scripture. Um, but his... Good. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, um... Amy Carmichael came to mind when you're talking about um, pain and uh, doing what is the right thing to do to minimize it or get rid of it. She lived her whole end of her life in pain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was, and that's when she did most of her, so much of her writing and her pain and her uh, learning to, to love God through that pain because that was part of his, of what he ordained for her. So sometimes pain is something that God gives us to draw us closer to him. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, we, we've, uh, we've seen that in a number of people that we have known. In fact, there's a couple of them that handled pain so well. I, I've often wondered, you know, could I do that if I, if I were in their situation? Because uh, you would go to minister to them because of the pain they were in, and they ended up ministering to you because, because they just understood pain, and they understood that it was God's purpose for, that, for them to have that, and, and, they, um, and they were just so joyful and so positive, even in the midst of pain. So thank you, uh, Meredith, for sharing that. Very, very helpful. Pain isn't always something that we want to take away. Remember that it's not always something we can take away. You, one of the one of the the one of my I won't say favorite, but one of the uh, the uh, proverbs that the the preacher has given that that I've always taken to heart and had to remember is uh, who can make straight what God has made crooked. That is, God brings those things into our lives that we just can't fix, and He does it for a purpose, and He has a good purpose for them, and we just have to accept that. 
um, and 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 then trust him through it. So there are things that we that we wish would go away, like uh, you know Paul's thorn in the flesh, and God says, "No, my grace is sufficient," and that's the way uh, He wants us to live. Here, the key is to remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, uh, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, "I have no pleasure in them." Um, here he's calling all of us to live a God-centered life, uh, making God um, our first and highest priority. And again, I think we need to remember <laughs> what the word remember means in scripture, um, because we use the word remember, I think in the English, in a, in a different way. Now, maybe it has uh, that other meaning. I, I didn't go in into the uh, English dictionary to see if it did, but I, generally speaking, when we when we think of remembering, we think of thinking about something that's happened in the past. Uh, you remember the good old days, or do you remember when we did such and such? Uh, we, we've got a friend here uh, this weekend, and part of the time we've been talking about remembering the things that we did years ago, because uh, we first knew her when she was a fifth grader um, in Paula's Sunday school class back in St. Louis years and years ago. So we have a lot of life we've lived together, and sometimes it's fun to remember, but when scripture uses that word, both in the Old and the New Testament, it means not just to think about it, but actually to do something with it. So when you think of the thief on the cross, when he asked Jesus to remember him, he didn't want Jesus just to think about him, he wanted Jesus to take him with him. He wanted to be in paradise with Jesus, and Jesus said, that's what's going to happen to you. Uh, the remembering is the taking of action. And so here, to remember God means in every situation of life, God needs to be central. He needs to be our focus. Uh, he needs to be the prime thing that we're focused on uh, in every circumstance, that all of our life revolves around God. It's not just a, um, well, let me just read you what Derek Kidner says. He says, such remembrance is no perfunctory or purely mental act. It is to drop our pretense of self-sufficiency and commit ourselves to him. So it's, it's a, it's a commit, commitment of our entire lives to, to Christ, to, to God, and to, uh, and to stay focused on doing that. Um, and what the preacher is saying is the best time to do that is when you're young. Um, and then you have your whole life ahead of you to serve the Lord. Not that other people don't come to faith in Christ at a later age and, and, and still can have a, a wonderful um, and meaningful life and, and service to him. But the preacher's message is do it as soon as you can. And then stay focused on that because life is going to, uh, the evil days that he's talking about are the ones that come and life becomes more difficult as we become older. And it's more and more difficult to find pleasure in life and more and more difficult to stay focused on God. Um, so if we built a habit of our lives centered around him, as we grow older, that habit will, will um, help us to remain faithful, and that's why he uh, focuses there. And then for the next several verses um, comes this beautiful poem. Um, if you haven't uh, been real familiar with it, I hope you will, you will see how, how just uh, impressive it is, and not only in terms of the, the beauty of the words, but in the way that he presents growing old. <laughs> And, uh, and yet at the same time, it, uh, it is a kind of a, a, a figurative description of uh, physical manifestations of growing old. Um, he begins uh, with one illustration, and then he immediately moves into a different one. So I'll, I'll keep verse two separate from the rest. He says in verse two, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. So here is a picture of the troubles of old age, like a gathering storm. And we see that storm clouds come and they blot out the sun in the day and they blot out the stars and the moon at night and it's just cloudy. And then all of a sudden the rains come. And what I want you to see is as soon as the rains are over, another storm gathers. It's, it's, it's kind of like the Northwest in the winter. <laughs> Pacific Northwest, because they, you, know, you got one storm and you just look at the weather map and it's one storm after another, after another. And the picture is when we're young, we have these periods of sunshine where the 
but the clouds clear and the sky is beautiful. But as we get older, it just seems like there's trouble after trouble after trouble. It's like there's storm cloud after storm cloud. And he's saying before that happens, you know, make sure that you're in a right relationship with God and that you're walking with him. Um, it was interesting that Derek Kilner had uh, this to say, uh, which I thought was good. He kind of expanded upon this. It's not just, it's not just physical ailments that, that uh, the preacher is talking about. He says, uh, ba based on this scene, he said, this scene is, a, is sober enough to bring home to us not only the fading of physical and mental powers, but the more general desolations of old age. There are many lights that are liable um, then to be withdrawn besides those of the senses and the faculties as one by one old friends are taken, familiar customs change and long held hopes now have to be abandoned. So there's a lot of things uh, that, uh, that come with old age. We, we've certainly seen a lot of dear friends go to be with the Lord here in the last couple of years. Uh, we've also seen a lot of change in life, in society, in the way we have to do things. Um, and all of those things are part of these clouds that, that the preacher is talking about uh, that just come, sometimes they just come with life, but they often come uh, in more abundance with old age. And then there's this picture um, of this house <laughs> that is falling down. <laughs> which is a, uh, it's a beautiful description, as I said, I think, of, of, of the things that come with old age. And I'll tell you up front, even though I'm not going to do it this way, probably the best way to understand this metaphor is just to see it as a whole and not try to pick it apart. And yet people have picked it apart. And I think for the most part, they're right. Most of these uh, pictures, these short little brief pictures that, that uh, Solomon gives to us, uh, are identifiable. Some of them we might be guessing at. Um, and sometimes it helps us to, to kind of picture in our mind the things that he's talking about. And sometimes it's more helpful just to step back and say, yeah, I see that picture of that house and how it, it is really falling apart. So we're going to do a little bit of both so that you can kind of see um, how it is that, that he's arranged this. He says, again, in the day. So now he's, remember your youth, before the days of evil, before the sun and the moon are darkened, um, in the day when. So we're still looking now at, at the progress of age and why it's so important to have uh, that relationship with God even as we enter that time. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed. Okay, the keepers of the house um, probably are the person's arms. And um, what are the keepers of the house doing? They're starting to tremble. They're starting to, <laughs> I think we can all picture that. We, we go to pick something up and we're, we're not as strong as we used to be. And we, we tremble even as, as we, we handle things. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to hold on to them. Um, and then the strong men, those are the legs probably of the person. They're, they're bent, it says they're bent with age. Uh, they're not as sturdy as they used to be. Um, I just realized the other day how unstable sometimes I am on a ladder. Uh, <laughs> don't notice it when I'm walking around on the ground, but I start to climb and I go, oh, oh I'm, I'm not as stable as I thought I was. So those are the kinds of things that begin to happen. And so he says that the strong men are bent. The grinders, <laughs> the grinders are probably the teeth. Um, the grinders cease because they are few, uh, particularly in Solomon's day. Um, probably older people didn't have a lot of teeth. And if they did, they probably weren't their original ones. Um, we know that even at the, in the beginning of, of our country now that, you know, people's teeth were replaced with wooden teeth when they lost them. We, we don't have, the, we don't have the, the medical ability that we have today. Um, and then the windows. The windows are probably the eyes that are now dimmed. Uh, either with cataracts or with a general loss of vision. And so we see dimly, we see poorly. Uh, glasses help, but I'm noticing even with glasses, I don't see all that clearly anymore. And so there's this picture of physical degeneration going on. And then he goes on uh, in verse four, and the doors on the street are shut. 
when the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. So the doors are probably the ears, um, the ears that are now either deaf or hard of hearing um, and thus they're closed to the hustle and bustle of the noisy street. They, uh, they don't, uh, older people tend to hear less and less and even with hearing aids, uh, sometimes we just uh, can't get, um, we, we, we don't hear much. Uh, our next door neighbor, uh, before he passed away at, at I think pretty close to 102, uh, he was deaf for several years and, and practically blind. I don't know how he got around, he did. He still managed to make it to the mailbox almost every day to get the mail, but, um, but it was one of those things where he didn't hear anything anymore. He, he didn't hear the sounds of life um, and he didn't really even see much as well. And it says, it talks about the sound of ground, grinding, which could possibly be the, the business of life. One of the main things in that day that people heard all the time were, was the grinding of grain because people did that all of the time in order to, uh, to make, uh, the, to, to process the grain so that they could eat their meals. And so that was one of the sounds that you heard as part of the of business of life. And it seems to be that what Solomon is saying here is that increasingly older people are cut off from the daily, uh, from daily life. And I think we see that, don't we? We, we even talk about sometimes uh, people being shut in. That is, they're unable to get out. They're unable to join with others. Um, and that's one of the, I guess, the beauties of, of, uh, of Zoom <laughs> is, that, is that we've eliminated some of that, at least in part, for people who are not able to come out is that sometimes we can join them at least uh, electronically. And then he said, one rises up at the sound of a bird. Uh, older people tend to have trouble sleeping. And so they're up early with the first songbirds. And um, some of you I know get up that early. I find that the songbirds are noisiest about four, 415. That's when they're really, uh, really making a lot of noise. You know, by six or so, they're pretty quiet. Uh, but early in the morning at 4, 4.30, sometime in there, um, they're just really going at it. And uh, so the older we get, the less we tend to sleep, the, the earlier we get up and we get up with the birds and we hear them singing, whereas other people get up later and miss all of the beauty of the song. And then the daughters of song, most likely our vocal cords are unable to make the music we used to make, maybe sometimes unable even to speak uh, the words that we used to speak um, as a result of the aging of those things. And then finally, he goes on and he says, they are afraid also of what is high and tares are, on, are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. So this phrase, uh, afraid also of what is high, is, is a little more difficult. Um, many of the commentators think that what the preacher is talking about is their fear of falling uh, or of being jostled uh, or even of being attacked when we talk about terror along the way. Um, those are the things that generally older people are concerned about. Uh, particularly jostling, you know, you just don't have that stability anymore and to being bumped in a crowd or falling down uh, are, are very frightening things for people who have difficulty or uh, getting up or maybe even an impossibility of getting up. Blossom, the almond trees blossoming, I think is a picture of, the, uh, of one's hair that's turned white with age. Um, not everybody's hair turns white, but many people's hair does. And if you've ever seen almond trees blossom, uh, it's a beautiful white uh, color uh, of all of the, uh, the blooms on, a, on an almond tree in the springtime. And it looks like white hair. Uh, so I think that's the picture. Uh, almond trees were very uh, common in Israel at the time. And so I think he uses that as a picture of uh, the changing of one's hair. And then the grasshopper drags itself along. So when we think about the grasshopper, one of the things that, that uh, I used to be fascinated with insects when I was a child and the grasshopper particularly because of its ability to jump. I mean, these are very agile insects that, that can jump great distances. Um, so the picture is 
uh, of this grasshopper that should be uh, the embodiment of agility. And now it's dragging itself along. Um, one, one commentary said it's a goner. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it's this picture of, um, you know, us being slowed down by age and by disease. Um, uh, the picture of the old man's slow, stiff walk. I remember uh, Tim Conway used to do the old man uh, routine on Carol Burnett, and it was so hysterical the way he walked. But it was a picture of somebody in old age that just, that's just the way it, it was. And so I think that's the picture that we have here. Desire fails. Um, we suffer from diminished desire. It can include sexual desire, but it doesn't have to. There's just so many things that that we lose desire for as we go, grow older. And uh, and so he's saying that's another fact of life because man is preparing to go to his eternal home. Uh, here, not just the grave, uh, but preparing to meet his creator and his judge is what is what uh, Solomon is talking about. And then, of course, the mourners, the mourners are the ones that are going to carry our bodies out for burial. And so, first of all, he pictures then this, this house and the things in it, um, describing how little by little, as we grow older, these things begin to happen to us. And then in verse 6, he actually gives us these memorable descriptions of what death is like. Again, he doesn't call it death, but the way he describes it, that's what he is talking about. And he says, before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. So the first picture is of the snapping of a silver cord and the shattering of a golden bowl. And it's possible these two are connected. Uh, it's possible that the golden lamp, uh, which is probably the picture, is suspended by the silver chain and the chain is broken and the whole thing falls and is destroyed. So its ability to provide light is, is snuffed out. Um, even if that's not the actual picture, it's clear that these two things are very precious and now they've, they've been destroyed, they've been broken, and they're um, useless. In the other two examples, the pitcher that's shattered at the fountain and the wheel broken at the cistern, there's a picture of two things that are uh, often used to draw water from a well. And the picture again is that these ap these, uh, the apparatus that's used normally uh, to draw that water is destroyed beyond repair and therefore it's useless in drawing any life-giving water. So in each of these four examples, kind of two, um, two, two sets of two, uh, there's this picture of what happens at death. And that is that basically we're unable then to carry on any of the, of the activities of life. And when that happens, verse seven, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So when we die, uh, our bodies return to the dust. This is the curse that God pronounced on uh, Adam uh, when he sinned. He said, uh, well, we'll just look at the whole thing because this is the, uh, this is the um, actual the punishment or the curse that, uh, that God gave to Adam. Uh, it's not the whole thing, but it's really the final thing that, that uh, God says um, to the man. Um, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it were you taken." for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And so we see um, Solomon now reminding us that this is God's curse, so that when we die, our bodies return to the dust, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it to us. Um, and there it is. Our bodies remain there um, until, um, as believers, they are reunited again at the resurrection uh, as promised by God. 
So these are the sober realities. Uh, he said it in a way that's beautiful. He said it in, in a way that helps us to see it in a different light than maybe sometimes we look at it. And yet at the same time, there's sober realities uh, for the longer we live, the more we're going to see of these kinds of things, the more we're going to struggle with these kinds of issues. Um, we all have to face them because we all live in a fallen world. That was one of the reasons, in fact, it's the primary reason why the preacher calls this world vain. It's because it's a sinful world. It's a world that's been cursed by God because of the sin of man. And therefore, uh, these things happen as a result of sin that has entered into God's perfect creation. And so, again, the call to remember our creator, and the sooner the better, uh, because he makes all the difference in the way that we live our life here. Uh, Philip Ryken, in his commentary, I thought had a just a, a really sweet summary of this section. Um, I hadn't even thought of the things that he said, but I thought he summarized it really well, and so I, I would like to just read that to you before we finish with those last verses. He said, be encouraged by the beauty of this poem. Growing old and facing death are some of the hardest experiences in life. The Bible is honest about this, but not bitter. In fact, this passage contains some of the most beautiful words ever breathed. The Holy Spirit took special pains to treat aging and dying with dignity. This shows God's loving care for his people all through life, even down to old age, and then on to the grave. The scripture says, quote, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints end of quote, Psalm 116, verse 15. But it is not only the death of his saints that is precious to God. They are precious to him throughout the whole process of aging. I think that's really worth remembering that uh, this picture reminds us of just how much God loves us and how much he cares for us, um, even as we go through these difficult times of life. Now, you'll notice I started a new section, even though most of your Bibles put verse 8 um, with what we've just been talking about. But I think there is a change, and um, I put it there for a reason, um, and hopefully you'll see the reason in a few moments. But when we look at verse 8, and it says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity, you say, well, I heard that before. <laughs> And you did. It was his first words. It's his first words and it's his last words. This is actually a literary technique known as inclusio. Um, and, uh, and it reinforces, it does a number of things. But the first thing that I want you to see is it reinforces his main point. And his main point, we need to make sure we, we get and we, and, and, and we're, and we, committed to ourselves because it's so, so important. It's a point that I really don't think most of the world understands at all. Um, but we did look at, uh, as we went through this, we did look at some quotes from other people who did understand that that's really the truth. But the truth of the matter is, if there is no God, then there is no judge. And then there is no final judgment. And then there is no ultimate meaning in life, and so nothing matters at all. You remember that we, uh, I can't remember who it is that I quoted to you at the time that said, we simply need, um, since, since there is no God, there really is no purpose in life, but in order to be able to live life, we have to just make something up. We have to live in this fantasy uh, as if, as if the, uh, life mattered, uh, even though it doesn't, because that's the only way we can keep going. And that's actually an honest appraisal. Uh, you know, people can't live if they, alter, if they really do believe that there's no meaning in life, what's the point of living it then? And so they make up a reason, even though it's not, it's not a valid one. And so our preacher is trying to help us to see that, that for life to have meaning, he's been searching for the meaning of life, and he's now telling us that life has no meaning unless you bring God into the picture. Uh, God is what brings meaning to life, and if God doesn't exist, then life is pointless. The other thing that he wants us to, to remember, which is related to it, um, and he said in the beginning, and now he'll say again, is that there is nothing new under the sun. And again, he does not mean by that that 
there aren't new inventions, there aren't better ways of living, um, that, that we haven't progressed in terms of our modern uh, conveniences. What he's saying is, under the sun, that is, apart from God, life is the same as it's always been. Um, the same vanities, the same disappointments, the same injustices, the, the same uh, frustrations that have always been still continue and always will. The other thing I want you to see, because I think it's important, is that when we first heard these words, all is vanity, it probably didn't strike us as much as it should strike us now. Now, if we've gone through this book before, that may be different. But I will tell you, the first time people read through the book, the first time that they start in Ecclesiastes and, and the author says, all is vanity, uh, most people don't believe it. Most people think, oh, it's not that bad. Maybe it's, <laughs> maybe it's not great, but it's not vanity. It's not useless. It's not meaningless. But now we've gone through now for 13 weeks and we've looked at the evidence. That's what uh, the preacher has been giving to us. Um, he's shown us how, uh, how he, if you try to live for pleasure, uh, it, it doesn't work. If you try to live for, for just uh, sexuality, and sensuality, it doesn't work. If you try to live just for knowledge, it doesn't work. If you try to live for power um, or wealth or uh, something else, it doesn't work. He even says that wisdom is relative. Uh, it's better than foolishness, but even wisdom, uh, particularly just human wisdom, um, is limited by the fact that we all die. So we may live a, a, a little better life than the fool does, but we all end up in the same place anyway. And then he talks about injustice and, and the, the things of life that are unjust. And he even talks about the fact that, that sometimes the, the, the righteous end up having more trouble than the wicked who seem to get away with everything. And so he's gone step by step by step to show us um, this vanity. And so now when he says all is vanity, hopefully you all jump up and shout, amen. <laughs> it really is a vain world. Um, again, he's not denying that it's vain. And it's even vain with God. But our approach to life and our ability to enjoy life uh, is different when, when we have a relationship with God. It's still a vain world because it's a sinful world. And God has allowed it to be that way. Uh, but he is redeeming us and the world that we live in through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this could have been the end of the book, <laughs> and actually might have been the end of the book, because what you're going to see in the rest of this is there's a change that takes place. Um, the language of the, the rest of the book is third person. The author has, up until this point, been using the word I. I did this. I did that. I found this. I discovered this. I applied myself to this, and this is what I found. And now we see at the start of, of, of verse 9, it says, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people. It's now talking about the preacher in the third person. So it's very possible that someone else wrote this ending, led by God's Spirit, but I want, and, and some, um, some um, commentators actually think that there's, there's two people that wrote these epilogues, one that wrote part of it and one that wrote uh, the rest of it uh, to conclude something a, a little different. I don't think that that's the case. Uh, I'm not even sure that there is someone else writing it, but if there is, I want you to see that the conclusion that is made is exactly the conclusion that the preacher was aiming toward. Um, nothing has changed. This is the conclusion that he wants you to walk away with um, from his writings. Um, this is the conclusion that, uh, that he has been hinting at, I guess we could say, all along, um, bringing God into the picture and showing us how life with God is so drastically different than life apart from him. And, uh, and so whether someone else wrote it or not, um, this is um, this is the message, and this puts a, uh, I think we can say, puts the entire book into perspective. But the first part of this um, talks about the way that the preacher 
organize the book. Maybe we should have started here at the beginning so we could see how it was organized, but it's a good time to do it at the end too, to see um, that this book that at times looked like it had no uh, organization really is very organized and really was written with a very specific purpose in mind. And so the author says uh, that the preacher taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. So what the preacher did is he, he studied all of the uh, and evaluated all of the wise sayings that he was familiar with, uh, many of which I think by the Holy Spirit, he was the one that, that, that said them, um, but he weighed them um, and, and picked the ones that he felt uh, accomplished his purpose that were, were going to be uh, used uh, to help people to see what he was aiming at. And those are the ones then that he included. He, he excluded or left out so many things he could have put in here. Um, but he, uh, he picked those things that would be most helpful to us and to accomplish his purpose. And then he arranged them very carefully. So again, there's a, there's a real logic to how this book is put together, even though some commentaries would deny that. And I've tried to point that out as we've gone along, that this really is arranged um, to accomplish his purposes. It's not haphazard. Um, and if we look at it carefully, we can see how he put that together uh, in such, a, um, in such a, a marvelous way. And then verse 10, the preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. So the words of delight, this is, again, just this beautiful phrase that expresses the beauty of the Bible. Um, they are words of delight. Uh, I found this quote from Thomas Wolfe. He's a, a rather a well-known uh, American author, and he, he says this about the Bible, quote, it's the highest flower of poetry, eloquence, and truth, the greatest single piece of writing I have known. And I think it's that understanding of the Bible that um, has uh, caused uh, colleges and universities for decades now to offer a course on the Bible as literature. Uh, the thought is that even if people don't understand the spiritual lessons of the Bible, you can simply read the Bible as great literature, and it's one of the most beautiful books ever written, and that was the point of the class. Now, again, we don't want to read the Bible just as beautiful literature. We need to see um, the the, the uh, spiritual uh, intent of those words as guided by the Spirit. But even leaving out the spiritual impact, the Bible is a beautiful book, and it's always been recognized, even by unbelievers, as a beautiful book. But furthermore, it provides words of truth. The preacher has written truthfully about God. He's written truthfully about life in a fallen world. He wants us to understand um, those relationships. And then the words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. So as we look at what's here, uh, and it's not just here, this is, this is part of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. So it really includes Job and Psalms and Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. Those are the five wisdom books of the Old Testament. And, and so as, as we conclude this, the words of the wise, which are included in all those books and actually all of scripture, they're like goads. And again, you know that the goad is a, one of the tools of the shepherd's trade. Um, it could take many forms, but the basic form was just a sharp stick uh, that could be, that the animal could be prodded with, could be stuck with, uh, to keep the animal moving. Sometimes animals don't want to move and they, they need a little encouragement. And so the goad was a way of moving the animal along. And so really what is being said here is that that's what Ecclesiastes is intended to do for God's people. It's intended to prick our conscience. It's intended to, uh, to make us uncomfortable enough to turn away from our sin and get back on the right path. Because Sometimes we are tempted to go down the wrong path. We're like sheep. We stray off 
um, and, and we start to go our own way. And the author is saying, the words of Ecclesiastes are designed to bring us back onto the straight and narrow and to live a life that's pleasing to God. And furthermore, they're like nails firmly fixed. I love this picture because uh, the idea is that when we think about these wise words, uh, hopefully they become a permanent part of our minds, a permanent part of our thinking. They become like nails that are pounded deep into a block of wood. And as I think about that, I think about the number of times that I've had to take apart something that was nailed well, and, and how hard it is to get nails out of wood when they've been driven deeply into the wood. It's really hard uh, to get them out. And I think that's the picture. These are images that the intent of these images is to stay in our minds, and therefore to be used by the Holy Spirit um, to prod us. Uh, so that uh, we always have them before us, and they're always helpful to us in terms of driving us back uh, to the way that God wants us to live. And then the author, which may be the preacher, but may not be, says, my son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and such study is a weariness of the flesh. Did I miss one? Oh, thank you. I've been reminded by the off, the <laughs> offline judge. <laughs> yeah, I do need to go back. This is really key. They are given by one shepherd. This could be a reference to the preacher, but I think it really is a reference to God. Um, and that's why if you look at your translation, most of your translations have shepherd as a capital. Um, and that's because they believe it's a reference to God and not to the preacher. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, God is re often referred to as the shepherd of his people. It's a very common description of God in the Old Testament. And of course, in the New Testament, Jesus himself refers, uh, refers to himself as the good shepherd um, who cares for the sheep. And so it's, it's, it's a very apt description of both our God and our Savior. And uh, this is the first appearance of this word in, in the book of Ecclesiastes. So it seems to distinguish um, the shepherd described here and the preacher um, and doesn't really identify them. So um, if that's true, and I think it is, this verse is uh, very important with regard to our biblical doctrine of the inspiration of scripture. What this verse is saying is the words of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes are the very words of God. Um, just like the rest of scripture, it's God breathed. It's God breathed out. It's God's word to us. And that's so important because of the conclusion that's going to be made in, in the next couple verses. Uh, it's God's word, and therefore it is of primary importance to us. And when we compare it to other works, and that's where I was going without, uh, without uh, looking at this verse, beware of anything beyond these, of making many books, there are no end, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. We need to be very careful. There's nothing wrong with reading other books. Well, we are encouraged to read books. We're encouraged to read as much as possible. Reading is a wonderful thing to do. But to put those books ahead of Scripture or to spend more time on those books than we do in the Word is dangerous because the Word, uh, the word of God is the Word of life. It's the Word of our Creator, our Sustainer, our Lord. Um, the other books are, are words of men, and they may help us understand the Bible, or they may take us in a different direction. So we are warned to be careful. Um, even in the uh, ancient world at the time of Solomon, there were already great libraries full of books. Today, I, I looked this up in a couple sources. Today, there's more than a million new books that are published every year. Talk about an abundance of books, <laughs> and we can't even read a 1% of them. Uh, there's too many of them. Um, and so we need to see that there's no, there's no shortage of books, but we need to be careful. The, the focus needs to be on the one that's really important, and that's the Word of God. And that leads us then to the final two verses and, and, and the final conclusion of the book. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, 
for this is the whole duty of man. We got down to just, just this out of, out of all that we've looked at. Uh, submission to the rule of God is the central and summary admonition of wisdom literature. Um, I want to talk just a minute about this phrase. This is the whole duty of man. The word duty is added, I think, for clarification. But in doing that, it takes away somewhat of what the preacher really wanted to say. It actually says this is the whole of man. This is what life is all about. This is the most, most important thing that anybody can do. Worship God, reverence God, fear God, love God, serve God, glorify God, and do what he tells us to do. Keep his commandments. You do that, that's why you were created. There, there is nothing else that could be added to that. And that's why Charles Bridges, I, I thought uh, his comment was so helpful. He says, looking at this phrase, it is the whole happiness and business, the, tum, the, the total sum of all that concerns him, all that God requires of him, all that the Savior enjoins, all that the Holy Spirit teaches and works in him. That's what it is, to love God, to worship God, to serve God, to reverence God, and to keep his commandments. You do that <laughs> to the best of your ability, and you're doing exactly why the things that God intended for you to do when he created you. And I think, um, as I think about that in, in terms of what I've seen happening in the last year and a half, I think we've strayed from that as a church. We've gotten away from, um, in, in many respects, we've gotten away from, from reverencing God the way that we should, and we've certainly walked away a great extent to, to keeping his word. And so I think this is a call to, to return. His word is what we are to obey. If it says to do it, we are to do it. We're not to try to excuse it. We're not to try to excuse our behavior. We're not to try to work around it or find a, a, a better way to do things. We're not to question it. We are to simply to do it. And here's the reason why we are to do that is verse 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. There's going to come a day when every person is going to have to stand before the throne of God um, for judgment. And when that day comes, uh, everything that we've ever done, everything that we've ever thought um, is going to uh, come to light. Uh, and um, it has eternal consequences. That doesn't mean that that, that, that we'll be judged and, and condemned to hell because we know that we have a savior who has died for every, um, every sinful thought or action um, that we have ever uh, done. But nonetheless, uh, those things will be exposed. And the key thing here, I think for us to remember is that where initially we might have been tempted to say the message of Ecclesiastes is that nothing matters, really the message of Ecclesiastes is that everything matters. Everything matters because there is going to come a day when everything is going to be brought before uh, the eternal righteous God of this universe uh, who knows everything and is going to judge it. And therefore, everything that we do has eternal significance. And we need to see that. And, and we need to make that our focal point um, as we live our life. Uh, we can't be casual about the way we live because everything really does matter. And that's where the preacher um, has brought us. And so I hope um, that our journey with the preacher has been <laughs> a profitable one, even though at times we may have struggled a little, um, and that in the long run, it will help us to, uh, to be more, um, I guess we can say, intentional about the way we go about our life um, so that we indeed can please him um, in the things that we do and think and say.